church. Thank you, worship team. He is a good God, and He is almighty. You know, if He was just an almighty God, and He wasn't good, there'd be a problem. And if He was a good God that wasn't almighty, well, He may not be enough. But He's all. He's good, and He is almighty, and He's a wonderful God. One of my all-time favorite cartoons is entitled, Eek the Cat. It's not on TV anymore, and the only way to watch past episodes is to watch it on YouTube. And uh, the cartoon is all about this purple cat who likes to help people. And his slogan is, it never hurts to help, which is the irony of the show, because every show he seeks to help somebody and continually gets hurt the whole time. Um, But no matter what happens to him, I don't know if it's his natural positivity or being naive or whatever else, um, he does nev- never sees a negative situation. No matter how he gets hurt, no matter what goes on, he continually has this positive, never hurts to help attitude. But does it always hurt to help? At least in my experience, the way I'm wired, I can't help someone without caring for them. I mean, sure, it doesn't hurt to help someone walk across the street or help them with their groceries or pay them a compliment. But to truly help someone in need often means that you have to sacrifice your time or your money or your energy or even physical or emotional health. I mean, it's an investment in someone else. Many times, helping people feels like you're pouring, air, pouring out and you're rarely getting poured into. Um, have you ever helped somebody uh, and really helped somebody and you didn't get a thank you back? Or maybe you sacrificed hours of your rest or time with friends, with family, in order to help someone else, and they just took it for granted. And, uh, and that's frustrating. I mean, this is the church, right? So that's what I hear more often than, than most, is I'm just tired of pouring out. I'm tired of, of giving to people. And, 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 and after a while, you know, you just kind of get somewhat resentful, right? Like, I've done so much for so many other people. What's, what's happening to me? And so a question comes up, do we have a right to get paid? Do we have a right to get paid? If you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, We've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians, um, and uh, this is a part of 1 Corinthians where I feel like Paul is venting a little bit. It's you know it's okay to vent every once in a while. It's it's you got to be careful how you vent, and maybe who you vent to. But uh, if Paul vents, I think it's okay for us to have those moments as well. And I'm thankful for it. He puts into words what so many of us have trouble expressing. But it makes no sense, right, to give your life to something that doesn't seem to have much of a return and leaves you worn and weary. And, and again, this might be your experience in your Christian faith. You know, maybe you were more active in the church years ago, but you, you felt like you poured out for so much and so long and you didn't get anything back from it, or, or you got taken advantage of. Churches are just as bad as, as any other place. Sometimes we don't say thank you enough. Sometimes we, we don't honor the people that, that sacrifice so much for us. So let me just pause here, outside of the sermon, outside of my notes, and say thank you. Thank you for your years in Sunday school and kids' church and vacation Bible school and worship team and sound and video and the list goes on and on. Small groups and prayer times and and special events. The list, all of you, every single one of you I know has invested and so you might have not even gotten a thank you. And so it, it does not compare to what the value of what you have given to the church and given to the Lord can be. But at this moment, please receive a thank you from me. And I, I hope you'll be encouraged by today's message. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1-6. through 6. Am I not as free as anyone else? Am I not an apostle? Haven't I seen Jesus our Lord with my own eyes? Isn't it because of my work that you belong to the Lord? Even if others think I am not an apostle, I certainly am to you. You yourselves are proof that I am the Lord's apostle. This is my answer to those who question my authority. Don't we have the right to live in your homes and share your meals? 
Don't we have the right to bring a believing wife with us as the other apostles and the Lord's brothers do and as Peter does? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have to work to support ourselves? I don't know about you, but it seems clear to me that Paul is feeling really underappreciated. And yet at the same time, I think he's also struggling with people's expectations of him. Either they don't expect enough from him, they they don't see him as an apostle or a person of authority, or they expect so much of him that he doesn't have the time or the availability to enjoy some of the simple pleasures of life by even sharing a meal in someone's house or, or having a wife. And so a person's calling in life can be a difficult thing to understand if you're not experiencing it yourself. I get this question from time to time as a pastor. What do you do as a pastor? I mean, I know what you do on Sunday mornings because I I see you, but what does a pastor do? That, That is a number one question I get. And it's not that people are being mean or rude or they just don't know. Uh, most, most of you interact with me maybe once or twice in a week uh, consistently, and so uh, I'm going to bring some clarity to you today as to what the life of a pastor looks like. Now, this is true of me. Not all pastors are the same, uh, but this is mine. So I teach a middle school Bible class four days a week uh, for an hour. I'm in charge of managing the facility of our church from renovations to maintenance, and so I work with our building and grounds chairman, Shout out for Darren Stockett, amazing man, Uh, to make sure that everything is in working order. Uh, I prayerfully seek to meet the needs of our church body. That means Pastor Sean and myself work hard to know what is going on in your life and how we can assist either physically or spiritually in sharing your burdens. I write a sermon weekly, preparing my slides and take the time to make sure I deliver it clearly. Hopefully it's clear. Um... I teach the youth on Wednesday nights. I manage my staff, making sure we're working together in the direction God wants us to go. I work constantly with the board of stewards on finances and facility use and the pressing needs of our church family. I make phone calls and text messages, checking on people and giving them pastoral care. I meet people in their homes and nursing homes and hospitals. I seek to comfort grieving families during times of loss and share final words at funerals. I counsel and encourage couples seeking marriage. I vision for a local church discipleship and growth, trying to match people's spiritual gifts and callings with the needs of the church. I create the podcast, radio broadcast, and the road sign. As you've seen, the road sign hasn't been updated in a while. It's on me. I set up the soundboard, multimedia, and make sure everything is in working order on Sunday morning and that the chairs are straight. I'm on call 24-7 to rush out and meet people at their most difficult times and lowest points and give them hope in Jesus. All of this while balancing home life, my family, doctors, dentists, car maintenance, taxes, meals, house projects, and occasionally sleep. Now, I did not tell you all of that so that I can get a pat on the back. But what you don't know, you don't know, right? How often do we suffer by what we don't know? And I'm sure that I could ask every single person in this room, tell me what you do in a given day. Tell me about the responsibilities. Tell me about the the burdens you carry. And my response to you would be, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you make it every day. I don't know how you balance everything well. I don't know how you're you're, you're carrying all these balls that you're juggling in your life. And uh, Paul is struggling here because he, he, people don't seem to realize all that he's called to do and accomplish And he doesn't feel like they are properly appreciating him or compensating him. He even says, is it only Barnabas and I who have to work to support ourselves? Now, let me be clear here. I didn't share what I shared because I'm looking for a raise. I'm not preaching this message because I have some sort of issue with you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I do not. As you know, we've been going through 1 Corinthians. So this was the next chapter. And I have not been waiting to preach this message. Paul is giving some direct and honest guidance for how we're to live the Christian life. But I believe it's important that we understand the life and sacrifice of full-time ministers, whether missionaries, pastors, or even Christian educators, or even those who are pastors that work a full-time job otherwise, or those who are involved with InterVarsity or other college ministries as well. Even beyond that, let's just take a breath And let's have grace and sympathy for everyone in this room. 
Because none of us know what following Jesus has led anybody else to. And so especially in this season and this day and age, we can easily get into that comparison game and, and let's just have grace and sympathy for each other, okay? Our expectations of each other are possibly and most likely unreasonable. And they may be feeling just like you, overwhelmed and underappreciated. And so in this room right now, you are loved and you are appreciated. And I am the first to tell you, I have no idea what your daily life looks like. I could ask you the same question. Besides Sunday morning, what do you do? And you may be able to, to, to open up the books for me. And, and, and it's funny, even at sometimes at, at funerals that I've done for people, and I hear what they've accomplished and what they've done, I, I, don't, I learn things that I didn't know before. Let's keep reading. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 7 through 11. What soldier has to pay his own expenses? What farmer plants a vineyard and doesn't have the right to eat some of its fruit? What shepherd cares for a flock of sheep and isn't allowed to drink some of the milk? Am I expressing merely a human opinion, or does the law say the same thing? For the law of Moses says you must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. Was God thinking only about oxen when he said this? Wasn't he actually speaking to us? Yes, it was written for us, so that one who plows and the one who threshes the grain might both expect a share of the harvest. Since we have planted spiritual seed among you, aren't we entitled to a harvest of physical food and drink? Another part in the scripture says, a work is worth his wage. It's a principle in the world, both according to God's law, and it's a principle in the secular world. Uh, And so that's a big debate right now, and I don't want to get into a full economics discussion right now, whether the, the minimum wage cost or whatever else, because that's this is a huge topic right now in our culture. But I will say people should be properly compensated for what they do. Now, some people overestimate their value, and other people work jobs that no one wants for peanuts. Uh, but I will say that this principle is true, that, that a worker is worth his wage. And I think that's one of the reasons why God established the principle of a tithe for believers. It helps us understand, yes, that that all we own, everything that we own, we say we own, we don't own, right? God has entrusted to us everything we have, from our breath to our health to our abilities to our talents, everything. And so the tithe is a principle where God says, I've given you 100% of what's mine, and you get to keep 90, and you give 10% back to me. And so if we have that proper teaching and perspective, tithing is not a problem. Because God's blessed us with 90% of of what he has, and we only have to give 10% back. But tithing also has a practical side. It enables you to have the leadership in the church that you desire. Do you want to have a vibrant youth group program with a fully paid youth leader or worship leader or kids ministry or young adults? I think we all do, right? So are you paying your tithe? Do we want to do outreaches in our community or to continue to create an atmosphere and a facility that's conducive to worship? Are we paying our tithes? Churches are 100% dependent on people who are called to their local assembly. At times as a pastor, I get frustrated when people leave our body because they say, well, I really wish you had this, or this is a part that I think would really minister to our family, and so we're going to leave your church because you don't have this. And what's frustrating to me is we don't have it because either we're not properly giving or there are not enough people to offer those services. And so there's this ongoing cycle that occurs because people leave us because we don't have it. And when they leave, we have less people and less resources. And so we just go through the same process over and over and over again. Not paying your tithe isn't any different than not tipping your waitress or not paying your car mechanic or ignoring your electric bill, or the carpenter that's renovating your house. Those called to ministry give their lives for you, and what they receive in monetary pay is entirely dependent on your willingness to give your 10%. Not to mention that tithing is a command given by God. So not only are you not compensating people for their labor, and every good minister of the gospel is dedicated to your life and to your benefit, but you're also robbing God. Let's be honest, when we struggle to pay our tithe, 
we aren't thinking about God and we aren't thinking about others. We're only thinking about us and our wants and our needs. So tithing should hurt at first. But as you go through the process of tithing, you receive so many benefits and there's so many miracles that you see how God provides and makes a way that it actually gets to be something that you get excited about. I know that's hard to believe, but it's true. Let's keep reading. 1 Corinthians 9, 12 through 18. If you support others who preach to you, shouldn't we have an even greater right to be supported? But we have never used this right. We would rather put up with anything than to be an obstacle to the good news of, about Christ. Don't you realize that those who work in the temple get their meals from the offerings brought to the temple, and those who serve at the altar get a share of the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord ordered that those who preach the good news should be supported by those who benefit from it. Yet I have never used any of these rights, and I'm not writing this to suggest that I want to start now. In fact, I would rather die than lose my right to boast about preaching without charge. Yet, preaching the good news is not something I can boast about. I am compelled by God to do it. How terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. If I were doing this on my own initiative, I would deserve payment. But I have no choice, for God has given me this sacred trust. What then is my pay? It is the opportunity to preach the good news without charging anyone. And that's why I never demand my rights when I preach the good news. So do you see a shift here, right? He's already established something. He's, he's, gonna, he's speaking to both sides of the perspective. The first thing he established is a worker is worth their wage. People should get paid for the value of their work and their calling. And that's a hard and fast truth. But then he shifts to his own attitude and perspective. I have a right to compensation, but I will not demand that right. What Paul's saying is, my life is about the gospel. And if I spend my time and effort arguing about my money and my worth, then I become an obstacle to my calling. A couple times every year, K-Love has a fundraiser on their radio program. And do you know what I do when they start having fundraisers on their program? I turn to another station. Why? Because they're missing the point of why they... Now, I know they, they, they are dependent on people giving. Don't get me wrong. I understand why they do it. But it's a distraction to why they exist. It's a distraction to the gospel. You know, when I was a kid, there was a lot of celebrities and musicians and other people speaking against TV preachers, right? Because TV preachers got to a point where they were talking so much about people and money and giving and, and we'd see their air-conditioned dog houses and you know all their, their, their jet planes and all the rest and they're talking about needing more and it, 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 it was a detriment to the gospel. That's what Paul's saying. I'm not going to be talking about money and what I need and what I should get because my life is about the gospel. I don't want to be a hindrance to that. And if I can be honest with you, I do not really enjoy preaching messages on stewardship and tithing because it, it feels like and it can sound like I'm self-serving. I preach on it because it's scriptural and it's part of our faith. I don't preach on anything that I'm not following myself. So even though I'm a minister of the gospel, I tithe regularly. I tithe my 10% 10, 10 and whatever else God lays on my heart and I've done it since I was a kid with my allowance. But we can all learn from Paul's example. The way we defeat self-seeking entitled attitudes is by embracing the reality that a person is worth their wage, but we also do not demand our rights, especially when it could be a detriment to our witness and the gospel. Guys, that's when the light of Jesus shines the clearest. When you have a right that you can demand and you don't do it, <laughs> and, 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 and your things are falling apart and and. And, and you're, you're losing, you're missing out, all the rest, and you're still content, and you're still joyful, that's the gospel. That's when it can shine. That's when people say, what is going on with this guy? Why are you doing that? Th that's the beauty of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah in the story of the fiery furnace. That's the beauty of it. It's not that they were in the flames and weren't consumed. It's the fact that the king of the world at the time said, you do what I say, you bow down to this idol when I tell you to, and everything's good for you. And they say, nope. Nope. No amount of pressure can cause us to cave to you, because there's only one God, and we love him more than you. <laughs> That's the testimony. 
And so that's the thing. They could have said, well, I have a right to live and exist. I, I shouldn't be here in exile. I should be in, in Israel. And, and I've always served God my whole life. And the reason I'm in the exile is because of all the knuckleheads that defied God and, and walked away from Him. And, and I, I, I'm just going to survive. I'm just going to compromise here because I, I shouldn't be here in the first. No, no excuses. And so we defeat those self-seeking entitled attitudes by seeing people's worth and not claiming things for ourselves. I want my attitude to be like Paul. Whether I get paid or not, I'll share the gospel and shepherd as a pastor because this is not my job. This is my calling. If I look back on my life, I've always been a pastor. I've always been the friend that we can talk about video games or TV or movies or comic books or baseball cards or whatever we were into, but I was always the friend that asked the deeper questions. How you doing, man? What's going on? What are you struggling with? Like, I, I was never one for superficial relationships. In, in kids' ministry, as soon as I got out of kids' ministry, I was volunteering in kids' ministry. As soon as I got out of the youth group, I was volunteering in youth group. When I was in college, I was our hall chaplain. Not because I was a Bible major, but I cared for the needs of the guys in my hall, and I wanted to minister to them. It's in my DNA. It's the way that I'm wired. Now, this doesn't make me better or less than anyone else. It's just the way God made me. I have no choice in this. This is who God made me. And guys, when we can get to a point where we embrace our unique design and qualities, when we can get to a point to embrace the way that God has made us to be, there's so much freedom in that. Because you stop comparing yourself to other people, and you're like, okay, it's fine that they're good and gifted in this way, and they're not the standard for me. Christ is the standard for me, and he's made me the way I am, with the way I talk, and my talents, and my abilities, and, and, and my personality, and he's got his own working for me. Ah, <sighs> freedom, right? Not demanding our rights and our freedoms for payment for what we do. We simply pursue God's call and trust Him to meet our needs. And what I love about Paul is ultimately he gets it. The most rewarding thing about ministry is not money. It's not money. It's not fame. It's not facilities. It's not attention. It's none of that. Now, money does cover our bills and, and pr temporary provides physical needs and desires. But the true joy is that we don't charge for the gospel. That's the true joy. Think about it. The gospel is the most life-changing, most powerful message in the universe. And it's free. What is the gospel? The gospel is that you and I are not mistakes. That every single one in this room was made by God intentionally and uniquely. That He loves every single cell of your body but when we were born into this world, we were born separated from the God that loved us enough to breathe life into us. Our sin, this desire to do our own thing, our, our desire to be Lord and boss of our own life, our desire to do everything that he isn't, is, is naturally born into us because we were born into sin. And so there's this separation from us and God and the God that's good and almighty and loves us and we can't get to him. The gospel says that God loves us. None of us are mistakes. We're intentionally made. We're beautiful in his sight. And he didn't leave us in our sin, eternally separated from, from him. He loved us enough to become one of us. Fully God and fully man. And he walked this earth and he said, this is what heaven's like. This is what the kingdom of God is like. This is the way the world should work. This is who I am. And this is who you're supposed to be. And he spent years and years doing that. And then ultimately he died our death. That separation, the cost of separation was death. And he said, you can't come to me. I'll come to you and I'll die your death and be laid in your grave. And, and the ultimate the most powerful thing about the gospel is the grave couldn't hold him. And he rose from the dead. And now we have a promise for eternal life. And so the gospel says that if any of us believe in what I just told you, if we admit that we're sinful, we repent of our sin. That means we give him our, our, our desires that are wrong. We give him the consequence of our action. We give him everything and say, God, 
I am sorry, I am wrong, I need you. And we allow him to change us through a process of maturity as we follow him all the days of our life. We're promised that eternity with the God that loved us enough to create us. It's the gospel. What I just gave you in three minutes is priceless. Priceless. Most powerful message in the universe. Now, there's times in our church history where people have tried to put a price tag on it. Indulgences and other things. And it's the darkest days of, of the history of the church where people tried to, to monetize the gospel. But Paul gets it. The greatest thing about what we do is we give you the greatest treasure in the universe and we don't ask anything back. That's why my rights and freedoms must always, always be separated from the gospel. And it's tricky for us right now in this day and age in America. Because we're moving our rights and freedoms, it seems like, daily sometimes. As our culture moves away from God, as our government becomes more corrupt. Is it okay is, that this is happening? No. Is it right? No. So what do we do? We share the gospel freely without a price. We share the gospel freely without a price. But what about my rights? Doesn't matter. But I know the gospel. People who are caught up in what they deserve miss the point. The best athletes in the world do what they do because they love the game. Because they have the ability. Parents, if you have a child that's gifted in any area, whether it's athletics or music or academia, listen, do not push them in those areas because you want compensation. You encourage that gifting because your child can do something that not many people can do. And because they can do it, let them use that for God's glory, for his pleasure, and he's going to give them a platform in the future to stand on. I have one daughter who is the best athlete in my household. And she did track one year. And she could have won every race. But you know what she did? She ran next to the teacher so she could talk the whole way. Best athlete in my house. By far. Did I push her to win? Nope. Did you have a good time, honey? Yeah. Good. She could have won every race. She was never winded. Kids are huffing and puffing at the end of the race. She's, she could go another 50 laps and be fine. Why? But she's got so much talent. No, no, no. The point is how she uses it. It's not for fame or trophies or anything else like that. It's for the pure joy of doing something. You know, the best builders in the world build because they love to do it. They want to create a house into a home. The worst builders are the ones that cut corners, right? They're the ones that'll say, ah, oh, this is according to code, but let's do it this way because I can pocket a little extra money for myself. They're doing it for the money. So do what you do, whatever you do, for the glory of God using your gifting for him and not for any earthly gain. Everything we have is an opportunity to present the gospel. So whether you work for McDonald's or NASA, our heart and approach can be the same thing. God has given me a gift and an opportunity to earn a wage. I will receive whatever God gives me, but I will work for him with the goal of having another day of sharing the gospel through my words, deeds, and actions. You are ministers of the gospel. Everything you do is not about what you get but about the gospel going forth. Verses 19 through 27. Even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. And when I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under the law. Even though I'm not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring Christ to those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. 
Don't you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete training to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. You know, politicians or salesmen, marketing executives, many times only want to connect with you or identify with you so they can take something from you, right? They don't care about you really. They just want your vote or your money or your time, and they have ulterior motives. And so we have a society full of distrust, don't we? We don't trust anybody because everybody has an ulterior motive. Everybody seems to want something from you. And if you have nothing to give, then if you don't have anything to give, then they don't want anything to do with you anymore. But Jesus is different, and his followers are different too. Listen, what do we have that God wants? What can we give him that he doesn't already have? I mean, does he need us to exist? That's what holy means. Holy means that he's complete in and of himself. There's no outside force or influence in this life that can complete him. He's totally and completely whole. W-H-O-L-E. And that means he's holy, pure, complete, contained. So what does he need from us? Nothing. So why does he want us? Because he loves us. <laughs> Paul says that he tries to find common ground with everyone, not to take from them, but to give himself fully to them for their salvation. I want common ground with everyone. Now, I, I don't have time to go through this passage this week. We'll cover it next week. But that's the kind of heart we should have. But what this means is, I might, I might have to live perpetually giving and keep giving. I might give so much and I might not get back what I've given out in this lifetime. And that's a fact. Let me just tell you, if you're going to measure your value and worth between the dash of your birth and your death here on this earth, let me just tell you right now, you are not going to get back what you give out if that's what you're cruising for, right? But if you think about eternity, he knows that everything he does is worth it because there's an eternal prize that's waiting for him that this discussion in this world cannot offer. Cannot offer. And so he uses athletes as an example. Uh, I love football. I can't help but love football. And uh, maybe some of you saw this discussion, but the, the USC head, co head uh, coaching job is available. In fact, I think I was with Luke when we heard the news, uh, that they're looking for a head coach for USC. And uh, uh, there's a guy on um, the Dan Patrick show, I'm drawing a blank on his name, that was saying, yeah, yeah, there, we're looking at lots of different options and, and naming different coaches' names. And one of the names that came up was Mike Tomlin, who's the head football coach of the Pittsburgh Stars, right? And uh, we love our Mike Tomlin. And, and so he, he was saying, yeah, he's got an older quarterback who, who may be retiring soon. He's been in that job a long time. You know, this USC job is so great that, um, you know, anybody would want it. So the next press conference, the, came, the, the, the question came up to Mike Tomlin. And Mike said, I am the head co football coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers, the greatest job in the world. He said, don't talk to me about college football. He said, they, they say never say never. Well, I'm saying never. He said, there is not a booster out there with a large enough blank check to cause me to leave this job and coach anywhere else but here at the Pittsburgh Steelers. And he, he was getting fired up. He was getting mad. If you know Coach Tomlin, he's, he's pretty cool most of the time, although he's always bug-eyed. Um, he was intense. And he said, I don't ever want to hear this question again. Why? Because his eyes were set on a goal and nothing compared to what he already had. You get where I'm going here? Now, I'm not saying a head football coach job in, in, in the pros is better than college. I think there are coaches designed for each level that are skilled in that area. But for him, he was saying, 
Don't even talk to me about a college football job. I have the best job in the world. And I'm not even getting in that discussion. That's how we need to be about our Christian faith. Don't offer me anything this world has to offer. It, it, there's not even a comparison. I have the best reward in all of eternity. I won't trade it in for anything. I have a friend as well who's, who's a college buddy. Uh, and I love to tell a story because he never played football. He was good at basketball, but he always got injured. Well, he's a coach on the coaching staff for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And he told me before the Super Bowl that Tom Brady came in and had all, all the special teams and all the offensive coordinators together. And, he, and he, he said, listen, for the next two weeks, you don't have kids, you're not married, you don't have bills, you don't have nothing. You're mine. And he said, if you do... What I tell you to do for the next two weeks, you're going to have a ring, and you're going to be world champions. And he had it regimented down to what they were going to eat, what they were going to drink, how long they were going to sleep, when they were going to sleep, how much exercise they were going to do. Every minute of their day was scheduled for the next two weeks. And that's why Tom Brady, I hate to say it, is the best quarterback of all time, because I'm a Colts fan. He is. Because he's fully dedicated to his craft. But I will tell you that all the rings and all the trophies that, that Tom Brady has won, they're dust collectors. They won't be worth anything 100 years from now. He can't take them with him. They can put it in his casket with him, but ain't going to do him any good. Whatever the world has to offer you does not compare to what we have in Jesus Christ. And yet... We need to, to train as if we're athletes toward a goal and a purpose, an undivided focus for the worth of what we're doing. Our very lives are our greatest message. That's how we live. I'm going to be transparent with you. Thankfully, you let me do that. But the start of this year, I had a surprise, right? I got a phone call that there was a newborn in the NICU who had no name and no impact on the society. He was abandoned by his mother, and from the world's perspective, he was a three-pound mistake. And when I got the phone call, I immediately knew that God had chosen me to be his father. Pastor Sean can attest to that. He's still laughing about it. Instant. <laughs> so, because of this surprise, I rocked and fed and changed a newborn every day for months. Struggling with all the issues he had as being a premature baby, among other things. And I didn't know if you, the church, would understand or feel neglected because my time and effort was divided among you and this child. And I have to admit, there were times where I thought, somebody in that church is going to think, what are we paying this guy for? But my peace came from God's word where he said, whatever you have done to the least of these, you've done unto me. And this was an opportunity for me to love my Jesus more and to know his love for me in, less than I, in, in, in a tough situation. And then I was, so as I'm holding this child that, um, you know, had no, no name and, and no value as far as the world, I mean, he's, a, he's the greatest mistake, right? If he lived or died, the majority of people would not care. And I'm looking at him and I'm remembering that my Jesus came into the world in less than ideal circumstances and situations. I'm thinking about Moses, right? Like Moses was born to a good family, but the king had ordered that they kill their son and they chose to allow him to survive. And because they did, he became the deliverer of the people of, of Israel. And they became a nation. And so as I'm looking at this child, I'm thinking, what does God have planned for you, little one? Now, I got to a place where I embraced my call for that season because I was doing the best thing I could as a pastor. I, I, I firmly believe that was the best thing I could do as your pastor was live the message. So my life was the message during that season. And so a person's worth and value does not come from what they do or what name they make for themselves. Their worth and value comes from God who makes us all in His image. And so, I can't explain to you the kind of payment my son gives back to me now. I, I can try. 
Like when he's in a room and I walk in and he hears my voice and about breaks his neck to try to find me, that's pretty awesome. And when he lights up, when he looks at me, when he hears my voice, when he fusses, when I walk by him and he reaches for me and I don't pick him up, that's pretty cool too. I can't explain to you what it means to have somebody who isn't, doesn't have your DNA and doesn't have your blood flowing through his veins, but he looks at you with full adoration and love because you are his daddy. But I can tell you that is how our God loves us and how we can love him in return. You can't pay God for what he's done for you or what he's willing to do for you or what he continually does for you. But I guarantee when we look on him in adoration and love, when we reach for him, when we about break our neck looking for him when things are crashing around us, he says, yes, yes, that's my boy, that's my girl, that's who I love. So I went through what I went through. I broke the pattern of what a good pastor does. I dropped balls that, that I was juggling for you. And it was good, and it was right, and it was okay, because that was his calling for me in that moment. That's freedom in Christ. That's that life in the Spirit. To follow one's calling in life as God has ordained and, and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ no matter the sacrifice is the most rewarding thing possible. The most rewarding thing. So in summary, we should pay a person according to their work and worth. Absolutely. Compensate, compensate people for what they do. Do not hold back. At the same time, don't seek to demand your own rights or worth. Instead, look for every opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think both perspectives are essential, and I think if both are in balance, we'll look like Jesus. And I think Paul's got it. I think he's got it. So you value and you put worth on everyone else, but you ask nothing for yourself and you receive whatever God gives you. That's freedom. That's life and our eternal value, our eternal reward is worth it because all of us are like my son. No name worth anything, no hope, no future. Most of the world doesn't care if you exist, but there's a God of the universe that says, yes, yes, I will care for you. I will pour into you. I will restore you. I'll teach you how to walk and how to talk and how to listen and how to think. And although you may not have started off looking like me, in the end, people will say, how are you not his by birth? <laughs> because you'll be his in heart and spirit and in truth. Amen. Lord, I thank you for today's message. And I thank you for a pastor like Paul who's honest. Oh, Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters in here. And this is a true struggle of our, of our generation to get to a point, God, where we're so burned out and worn out and tired and frustrated that we get to a point where we just demand our rights. And, and, and God, they are rights, absolutely. There are things that we could claim over and over and over again that we have every right to, but the gospel... The gospel says that the God of the universe didn't claim his own rights. But he laid aside everything that he was so that he could redeem us from death and the curse and make us new. And so Jesus, make us like you. Let us value people and what they do. Give us grace for each other. Oh, Lord, heal these wounds that have divided us. And change our, our heart and our attitude. Let us become disciplined like athletes to win the race for eternity. Help us to, to value the right things. And in those dark moments, in those moments where we don't have anything left, give us glimpses of heaven. God, as we, as, as we are 
crying and frustrated. Help us to see that you are holding us in your arms and that you want to give us spiritual food and you want to give us comfort. And God, when we make a mess of our life, you're even willing to change our diapers. (laughs) You love us that much. So God, you paid a debt you did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. But now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. As the lights dim down, um, church, we're not formal. We are who we are. We're family. So you come.